loud. And we are recording. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is David Ellis. I am the uh, artistic director of Earth and Air String Orchestra, as well as the cello soloist on our most recent project entitled Thankfulness in Solitude. This is a project uh, consisting of two performances. Uh, one of formal concert performance, one of which a very informal salon performance from my own apartment, and uh, featuring three uh, really wonderful Cleveland-based composers, uh, all of which with quite different styles. And we are joined today by Jeff Mumford. Uh, Jeffrey, it's wonderful to see you. Thank you. Good to see you too. Thank you very much. Um, Jeffrey has three works that we are featuring in the sort of formal performance uh, video, which you will be able to find in the description below. And uh, just to kind of go through these titles, and they are very evocative titles, Radiances Spreading from a World of Resonance Stillness. So that's the first piece that you'll hear on the program. Uh, revisiting Variazioni Elegiasi, I believe is how I pronounce it, once more. Yeah. Uh, yes, very good. Yeah. <laughs> My Italian needs some work, but mm -hmm. yes. And then, uh, and that's the third piece on the program. And then the final piece on the program is his To, gl to Find in the Glimmering Air a Buoyant Contun... Con Let me try that again. To Find in the Glimmering Air a Buoyant Continuity of Layering Blue. All of which I have to say, these are all three of them wonderful, wonderful pieces for solo cello. And thank, thank you, you again, Jeffrey. I, lo I love the cello. And if I had to pick and my favorite instrument, which I'm glad I don't have to pick, but if I did, it would be the cello. I've always loved the cello. I've written well, a lot I, of the cello. Yeah. And, I, I have to say, I mean, like, so Earth and Air has done a piece of yours before, which was the two Rhapsodies. Yes. And we did that yes. with Deborah Pay. And it was very striking when we were doing that. So I was not playing that performance, I was conducting, mm -hmm. but I certainly as part of that was looking at the cello part and just the whole array of sound colors that you were able to get out of the instrument, I found very, very striking, which is why I really wanted to make sure you were involved in Thank this you. particular performance. So I do want to talk a bit about the pieces themselves, but before we do, just to give them some context, I thought we would talk about your own general backgrounds. So, uh, Jeffrey, do you want to talk to us kind of how you got into music generally and what really brought you into composition specifically? Well, that's the long story. I've, 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 uh, had, I've done a number of interviews lately where people are asking about the history. I would say that um, I know, I don't know how many people believe such things, but I'm quite sure I have heard certain pieces in a previous lifetime. Mm -hmm. When I came to hear them in real time, I knew they had a resonance for me. My brother and I were given an album as little kids called A Child's Introduction to the Symphony, which had little excerpts from pieces from the repertoire. Um, we used to play little musical games with them and associate them with, with football teams, for God's sake, for whatever. <laughs> but we would we, toss around and sing these melodies to each other all the time. I also remember fondly growing up in DC. Uh, my father was a dentist. He's passed away, um, but he had a huge, huge record collection. A lot of jazz, a good deal of Count Basie in particular, which I, and, and, and Ray Charles and, and Ramsey Lewis. And I got to know a lot of these pieces. I used to call it, you know, it was daddy music, you know, and I listened to this on a regular basis. And I, I it's a very, very, I think a very, very um, powerful early, exposure to music, just hearing it in the house all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I remember Ray Charles covers of Hank Williams songs. I remember listening to April in Paris, of course. And um, he also introduced me to the first recording of the Beethoven Emperor Control that I had heard by uh, English pianist Clifford Curzon. Oh, wow. um, and also Kismet, the musical um, based on uh, music of Borodin. Um, one of the things I love so much about listening to those pieces, those jazz ballads, were the string arrangements, the lush string background. And I think that's where I, uh, start, I guess I would say I'd start to really love the sound of strings, in ensemble and in solo, but it's this lush, this is when people were actually being paid to play music in studios, live human beings playing live music in front of live people. I mean, 
what a novel concept. This, yeah. this, this, this pandemic is really, you know, I, I can't stand. I mean, we need to be with each other. We need to be play, playing with each other, making music together mm -hmm. um, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. um, but these string arrangements, these ballads, I remember listening to them um, and just falling in love with how the sound of, of this lush texture, um, people like Dinah Washington, mm -hmm. Gloria Lynn, um, Billie Holiday, uh, so, and then there's, you know, Charlie Parker with strings. Charlie, I mean, there, you know, I, which I discovered much later, but just the, in the, you know, that that album, those those sessions, the string arrangements were made by Mitch Miller. Hmm. Now, if you remember Mitch Miller, I've heard the as, name, as but a, would would you enlighten those of us listening who may not be as familiar? Mitch Miller in the day, in the fifties and sixties, he's an oboist. Hmm. And he used to have this show on Sundays called Sing Along with Mitch. Okay. And he had this chorus and he'd conduct very, very <laughs> but they would sing these popular tunes of the day, but he was an icon, Mitch Miller, Sing Along with Mitch. He was, he was a classically trained oboist and he arranged these, made these string arrangements with Charlie Parker. Um, so. It's really striking that your uh, influences are so I mean, you mentioned Charlie Parker, but you also mentioned a whole bunch of vocalists. And I thought that was very interesting because a lot of these three pieces in particular, but also your pieces generally, they might initially sound, because they traverse the whole range of the instrument, sometimes very quickly, really going from low to high very quickly, but they always have a lyrical aspect to them. And the gestural aspect, it always seems to be, you could conceivably put words to some of it, like you could really hear a certain syllabic quality. I'm wondering how much of that would you say has permeated your music generally, or whether that's kind of something that you just found with these pieces in particular, or? That's a very good question. You know, I like, when people ask me what kind of music I write, I would generally say lyrical atonality would be the best way to describe it. Um, I had the opportunity to study with Elliot Carter, who studied with Nani Boulanger, and Nani Boulanger's one of them, were her most famous quotes in terms of having music evolve and uh, expand is the idea of the grand line, never lose the grand line. And no matter how thorny the, the texture is, and certainly Carter's music on the surface can seem very thorny. It's very romantic, I think. And you never get lose a sense of that line, a sense of sinew and, and, and unfolding. And so in my work, um, I guess I'm aware of that. Uh, I, I think of my work as lyrical, um, again, irrespective of its harmonic language, which involves aspects of tonality and as well as, as um, a good deal of, 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 of dissonant counterpoint. Um, so I think the cello, it's not, people have said, is, perhaps the most, the closest string instrument to the human voice. So that may also have play a great deal to do with it. Although I think I approach other music, my, my other music in a similar fashion. Certainly I approach the cello, my cello music that way. Um, singing, there's many, there's so many ways of singing. And, and, and I mean, um, if you play an unresolved minor ninth, that's a song. I mean, it's, it's, if you play it the right way, I mean, it's, 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 it, 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 it affects you or your soul, you know? I mean, it's... It's, it's, it's yeah. It, we can go into this, especially with regard to the first piece, the radiance is spreading around from World of Resonance Stillness. I do want to talk a little, a little bit about that specific piece because there's a lot of what you're talking about mixed with, um, a certain amount of mastery of the instrument. So first of all, to give a little background to the listeners, uh, the first and last piece of the program, Radiance is Spreading uh, from a World of Rest and Stillness, was dedicated, am I right, to Mariel Roberts? Yes. Yeah, who mm -hmm. I, well, I do not, but I have since uh, seen, well, I've heard her name, and then since seeing her uh, name on the score, I did listen to a few things. I was like, I, I can see why <laughs> you wrote this piece for her. It totally lends itself. Um, 
And then the Defining Glimmering Air, A Boy in Continuity of Larian Blue was written for Simon Thorne's daughter, who I have met and have heard her play. And yeah. co they completely, both of those pieces, really emulate the people that they're dedicated to. And um, yeah, it, which I found very interesting. What I found interesting about both of them though, is that with that lyricism mixed with, and I was talking to someone about this the other day, that these pieces really, that they require you to master the instrument to a T because you really have to be able to know where that minor ninth shift is, for example, that you're referring to, which in a lot of ways I think makes these really, really gorgeous etudes for those who are getting tired of their popper and are looking for something <laughs> that is technically hard, but a little more lyrical. This is a good place to start. But, um, but also just the fact that they're oddly idiomatic because the sound colors, like there's a lot of specific places where you have to finger a passage in a certain way and it might not be on the string you expect, but it gets a certain color that's so specific and it lends itself to the lyricism that you're talking about. So um, for those who go on to listen to this concert, do kind of keep an eye on that in terms of when I have to go way up high on the D strain occasionally, or if I have to do some various jerry rigging in terms of the fingering <laughs> in order to make things work. Um, but the sound concepts are so fascinating in both of those pieces. Oh, thank you. Um, now you were talking about Elliot Carter, which uh, for those who know Elliot Carter's pieces are definitely, uh, you can definitely hear the influence in uh, these cello pieces, but are there other composers that Hopefully you would say? Too much influence, however. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to say, what other composers would you say influenced your style? Well, um, when I talked earlier about he hearing uh, pieces from an earlier lifetime, I don't know if you're familiar with the songs of the Auvergne. They are French folk songs orchestrated by a French composer named Joseph Cantaloupe, who studied with Vincent Dandy, who was considered an ama amazing and, and, and controversial, perhaps, orchestrator uh, and a composer of the 19th century. Lots of augmented chords, lots of, um, but his, his orchestration is, 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 is particularly unique. And so Cantaloupe orchestrated these songs for soprano and orchestra, mm. and they were gorgeous. I, I fell in love with them. Um, who else? Um, I, I love, this is a wide range of things. I mean, there, there's, you know, um, Johannes Ciccogna. Um, that is a name I do not know at all, actually. Do you want to talk about? franco um pre-Renaissance, pre between the medieval and Renaissance period. Um, his music is absolutely fantastic. Yeah. There's also a composer named Guillaume de Dijon, who's a medieval composer, troubadour composer, um, whose music, the harmonic language of which you would not be surprised if you thought this piece was written yesterday. Yeah. The dissonances and the, the sounds of these, these people. And then the usual suspects, Schumann Brahms. Um, uh, there's a, more recently, the work of Thomas Ades and Unsuk Chin, who mm -hmm. I find very, very compelling. Um, George Walker, Ollie Wilson. Um, composers whose work I, I, I really find very compelling. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's a lot. This is there's so much music out there. Exactly. And, and one so, can't always be aware of the influences. They, yeah. They're out there, you hear them, and you just, you know, you find a language that works for you. You construct your own language. Well, certainly for the listeners that are, or the watchers rather, who are watching this video right now, definitely if there are names in there that you have not heard before. I can tell you, Aside from the one that I did not recognize, a lot of these names are really underrated names in composition. So I highly, highly recommend you check them out for sure. Now, one of the questions I kind of want to uh, get from a variety of, or from all three of the composers uh, over the course of these interviews, the whole relationship of composer to performer to audience. 
And this is something that performers will occasionally get into, especially if they're changing things around, such as how the audience is sat around a performer maybe, or something along those lines. But this is something that composers have to kind of think about all the time. So I was wondering, uh, what's your philosophy in that regard, would you say? Hmm. I think a composer has the responsibility to write what he or she hears and to be as direct and as passionate as possible uh, in the language they use and what they have to say. But they ha I think one has to have something to say. Um, you're asking someone to get off of their, <laughs> their, their behinds, yes. get out of their seat, go to this place, concert hall, salon, whatever, and hear something that you're offering them. Music is a language. I, I, when I talk to students and, and, and I, I say the composer and the, and the audience have a relationship that I, such that they need to meet, meet each other halfway. I think the composer has the responsibility to be as direct, as I said, and as, as compelling in, in, in the, the, the journey, the story, the, 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 the language, the, the trip they're taking, the, the audience on and I think the audience has the responsibility to come to the concert with as few preconceptions as possible mm -hmm. to be open to be taken someplace they've never been before mm -hmm. when I listen to a piece of Brahms even if I've heard it for the 60,000th time I hear something new each time and I th there are no wasted notes in his music mm -hmm. and I look at, at as, a, as you're taken someplace from you you're taken from home to another place that you but you don't know where you're going yet but when you get there it's inevitable you got there and you've gone no you could have gone no place else that's what i strive for in my work mm -hmm. they are very transporting works for sure and kind of related to that actually we're about to get to a question that i've been i've been waiting to ask this for some time these titles are so evocative and are so uh descriptive like for, especially to find in the glimmering air, a buoyant continuity of layering blue is so specific. Um, how would you want your listeners to interpret these titles or are they purposely left open so that the audience can kind of come from it from a variety of angles? Uh, both are true actually. Okay. Um, before music took over in my life, uh, I used to be a painter. And um, the, I, the, my music is very influenced by time of day, by light, by um, differences of how light comes through a window, for instance, um, intensities of light, uh, nature, cloud imagery is particularly important to what I do. Um, when I was in high school, I used to look out the window um, morning, in Washington, D.C., in the summertime, there were tons of thunderstorms and the sky would literally turn purple and green. And that had such a huge impact on me. And I used to love to paint landscapes. Um, I have you know, I haven't had a chance to paint um, lately yet, but I, I'm married to a painter, a terrific painter named Donna Coleman. And um, so landscape, I teach landscape uh, as a concept, as a metaphor in my humanities class. I think the idea of creating an environment that the listener can enter into or the viewer can enter into in the case of a piece of uh, two-dimensional art of a painting uh, is very compelling to me. So I like to create scenarios where instruments interact with each other uh, in differing ways. One of the um, things I say in my artistic statement is like you're at, at a cocktail party and then someone is holding court and, and people around them were trying to get words and various words and edgewise with varying degrees of success. And so the person can either be um, aware of what's going on around them. Cloud can be moving at a certain rate of speed and another cloud can intercept it. Um, Scenarios in which there are relationships, how do I say this, that a group of instruments or a solo instrument will be going on 
developing some material, and other instruments, other instruments will make commentary on this on this journey. The the, the, the uh, other instruments will. The instrument has the choice of paying attention to what other people are saying or being completely self-absorbed. Mm -hmm. And I work a lot with that kinds of those kinds of relationships. In terms of cloud imagery, if you notice, and when you look at the sky, you'll notice that there's a lot of give between play, foreground and background, and clouds will split up and recombine, um, creating lots of layers of activity, light and, and, and the intensity of light. Those things are very influential and, and, and um, inspirational into what I do. I hope that makes sense. No, absolutely. I mean, granted, my mom's a watercolor. So if I'm hearing this, I'm like, oh, this all sounds very familiar. Yeah, nice. But, um, well, what kind of medium do, or do you paint in? Well, I, 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 when I was painting, I, I used acrylics. I, okay. did one, I did one oil painting with, with my wife when we were living in New York. We went out and did... Um, uh, some landscape studies and, and it was it was a lot of fun i'd love to get back to it it's only so many hours in a day i know exactly and so, you're really pumping out a lot of pieces at this time so i definitely understand yeah. for sure my wife is downstairs painting even as we speak speak so um yeah but, um, well very very interesting thank you probably the last question that i have for you is much more general and it's kind of related to what you were just talking about in terms of the images but particularly since your pieces are, I wouldn't say abstract because they are so specific in terms of what they aim, in terms of color. Mm -hmm. However, they might not be necessarily your average listener's normal fare. So I'm wondering um, if you had someone sit down to listen to this piece, you know, as we will all have our nice speakers to do so. Um, how would you want them to approach it? I would like them to be as open as possible to a new experience. Mm -hmm. I would like them to think, and whatever they think, coming to it from a place of adventure. Mm -hmm. This is one of the words I would come to say, and I, you know, I'd probably be thinking of a thousand different words after we finish this interview, but. Um, I would like, and I'm, and I'm very touched when people come up to me after concerts and say, well, I, I heard this, 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 and this, which may have nothing whatsoever to do with what I intended, mm. but that they took enough of their own time to listen to something and get something out of it. I think that's all any composer would want. Mm -hmm. They listened, they took the time, they invested enough of themselves into the experience of the piece to come away with it changed, mm -hmm. taken somewhere. It may not be the journey that I imagined when in, in conceiving of the piece, where I think, or the image or the colors or whatever, but it's a real experience for them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's what I would hope for. Yeah, most definitely. Well, I have to say, this has been really wonderful talking to you about these pieces. For everyone that's listening in to this and then also are watching the concerts, I highly encourage you, listen to each piece at least twice, that especially in entirety, that they are really, but they're also major experiences for the performer to undertake in terms of getting from beginning to end. But that's also kind of part of the process that for the listener, um, or do you, do you have like a minimal number of listens to your pieces that you would say? Like how many times would you want them to listen to say, uh, to find the glimmering air? As many times as they want. There you go. <laughs> I, as many, I hope as, as many times, as, I, hope, I hope often. I mean, I will, I will give you a, 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 a sequence. The, the very outstanding is the earliest piece. Mm -hmm. And to find in the glimmering air, written in 2010, and, and, and the most recent piece is written in 2019. Mm -hmm. that, that's the, is that the revisiting Variazioni? No, the Variazioni are the earlier piece. That's, that's 2001. Early, that's 2000, okay, yes. Yes, yes. I have to say, that is one piece that we did not talk about very much, but I do have to say, it's definitely... Um, it's the basis of the first of the two Rhapsodies, actually. Yeah. I was going to say, I, I recognize some of that content. I was like, oh, wait a minute. I kind of recognize that. Um, 
but it's also um, in a lot of ways, I would almost recommend uh, listeners, maybe you should listen to everything in order and maybe come back to Variazioni first because it's got this wonderful little budding sound thing that starts with and then try the other pieces too. But again, I mean, it's always a pleasure to hear your music. It's a wonderful pleasure to get to play your music. So thank you very much, Jeffrey. Uh, you. Do, you, do you have any... Um, concluding thoughts before we finish. Well, I really appreciate you doing this project. I mean, I wish in, in this surreal, crazy period that we find ourselves in, we need to be more resourceful all mm -hmm. the time in getting the word out because I think we need art and mm -hmm. music and literature and dance now more than ever. I, I can't overemphasize that. In an era where, we're being, where our society is being pulled apart, I'm not gonna get into politics, but we know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, we need not to. We need to resist that. We need to resist the temptation to 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 be, be, be pulled apart, and rather celebrate that which unites us. Mm -hmm. And I think that art is a great vehicle for that. Well, thank you very much, Jeffrey, for uh, everyone watching. Of course, the concert that. Jeffrey's music is featured on is in the description. Highly uh, recommend you check it out. Uh, likewise, the other interviews with the other composers are also going to be in the des uh, description below. So until hopefully the next time that I get to look at your music or whenever that is, Jeffrey, thank you again for joining us for this. I look forward to working with you again and thank you very much. Absolutely. Have a wonderful one. Everyone enjoys what they hear. Indeed. Thank you, everyone. See you. Bye-bye.